Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to Ludo History. My name is Adam. I'll be the host for today, and today we are hopping into the Assassin's Creed Valhalla Discovery Tour, The Viking Age. Who are the Vikings, and how do we remember them? When we say the term Viking, we are intentionally using a problematic word. No. There is some debate as to what the source is. What is very clear is that it is I'm coming, Gunhilda. Not an ethnonym. It is not a description for the people of medieval Scandinavia that they would have recognized. It is said that the famous naval battle of Hafsir took place near Stavanger in the late 8th century CE, which pitted the young Harald Fairhair against a coalition of petty kings determined to present or to prevent the young Jarl's rise to power. In this time period, it is likely that there is not even a settlement uh, in Stavanger. The town that we are in, and that exists here, is completely fabricated, though based on Kaipang in Oslofjord. Household slaves. Immediately good start. Enslaved people are one of the primary trade exports in the Viking Age. A bondi, a literally farmer but also freeman, could under extreme circumstances, renounced his status to a, debt, a sort of debt slavery. In fact, its soil was quite fertile along the coast and in the south, i.e. the entire country of Denmark, by the way, uh, and could yield a generous crop. However, Scandinavian harvest did pale in comparison to those in Frankish or Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, and an incentive for the invasion and settlement of those lands. This is not strictly speaking wrong, but it is misleading. The causes of the Viking phenomenon are one of the most complicated things and most contested things in historical scholarship. It is likely neither crop failures nor a lack of land or overpopulation that caused the Viking phenomenon. Instead, the phenomenon seemed to be a desire for portable wealth, uh, ambition among the elites who are competing to consolidate their power in this time period, and potentially religious pressures too, with increased knowledge uh, and restrictions around Christianity. Also, to talk about Thorstein's clothes, his clothes are actually, with one exception, really, really, really good. Uh, the only thing that has a problem is the overabundance of belts. The Gauvi was a keeper of the law. He knew the rules of his society by heart, and he used his knowledge to uh, guide its actions. Just as the gods gave order to the universe, the Gauvi's knowledge of law helped to keep the peace among the humans of his community. This is not terrible, but can be misleading. What is clear seems to be true is that the Gothi is both the secular and the religious leader of a community in the Viking Age. This gives them a lot of control over who is worshipped and how. The Fjellag was a legal, social, and business fellowship formed by two or more people, members of a Fjellag, often became trusted companions. This can also be called, like, uh, foster brothership. Well, we apparently need to go talk to a guy named Björn. I can't believe Bear. he'd betray me like this. The laws get broken all the, the, the dang time. Uh, honor was something ancient Scandinavians cherished, something called heather, or brightness. Honor was said to shine. Every social negotiation in the Viking Age is a negotiation of honor and social standing, where you win, usually by making someone else lose. Runes and runestones. I do not like this one. Uh, runes were both magic symbols and alphabetic characters. Engraved on stone, they created runestones. The Old Norse rune means secret or esoteric knowledge. And... So by the Viking Age, overwhelmingly, uh, the main exception appears to be in the Edict Tolum Vafrudismal, where it speaks of like Runa Jotnar, knowledge of the giants. And additionally, there is no evidence in pre-Christian Nordic religions that individual runes, like what we see here, were considered magical. Uh, magical inscriptions using runes would primarily be done with specific incantations carved in, uh, so it would be phrases of runes, and the ordering of the words gives it power. Hamingya, a family spirit. The Hamingya was the spirit of a family responsible for luck and prosperity. So, Hamingya uh, exists in this weird middle ground where it, in all but two cases in Old Norse, it refers to the abstract concept. I would much prefer, instead of them calling the family spirit a Hamingya, that they call it the Filgukona. Because that is what they are referring to here, which is coherently, consistently, all the time, used as a female guardian spirit. 
Viking Age Society, this is one of the things that annoys me the most in this game. Viking Age Society is not written. It does not have parchment. It does not have illumination. If you wrote something down, you carved it in runes on a wooden stick. Uh, death was not the worst punishment for medieval Scandinavians. The fate they feared most was to become Ullar or Outlaw, to be banished. No, de death was worse, actually. Because Ullar or Skogangr means that anyone can kill you with no repercussions. Turns out just getting killed is worse than being having the chance of being killed. Additionally, the Icelandic Lock of Graugaus only has three punishments available. You can find someone three marks of silver, you can outlaw them for three years, or you can outlaw them for twenty years. Those are your only options. And so outlawry happens all the time, because it is it's kind of the only choice you get. Uh, yeah, we have roused him up, let us go do the thing. This runestone, if you are familiar with Scandinavia, uh, Scandinavian runestones, in really any capacity you'll probably recognize, this is the Royal Yelling Stone, uh, raised uh, around the turn of the 11th century by King Harald Blåton, uh, Harald Bluetooth of Denmark, praising his father uh, and his mother, and claiming his conversion of the entire country of Denmark to Christianity. So you can see, dominantly, 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 right here, is Jesus. Uh, Stavkirka, notice that they never have an entry about this building. They just want us to believe that this is used as a combination temple, uh, pagan temple, and assembly hall, and stuff. It's not. Uh, as keepers of the hearth and home, women were responsible for keeping both home fires, cooking, and more complicated, I don't love this framing, vital parts of the family, burning strong and bright. If the lighter fire went out, like, this is Vestal Virgin stuff. This is Roman religion, not Norse. But Maniath Uh Medieval Scandinavians were quick to defend their honor. Someone who felt disrespected could ask for a contest to determine who was in the right. And once such trial by combat, the Maniath Nother, weapons were the weapons used were words. This is a factual error. There are two things that are translated into modern English as flighting. The Maniath Nother and the Senna. Uh, Maniath Nother literally means like an equal test of men. Uh, Yaf is, e is kind of also or even. Uh, the Maniath Nather is used uh, primarily and borderline exclusively in festive drinking occasions. So two people who start out equal will engage in a Maniath Nather in order to sort of test and negotiate their social standing without honor. It is not legal. Meanwhile, a Senna, the other category, is used between an insider and an outsider. So this is a way of generating a social space, according to Swenson, where uh, contests of honor can be decided in the first place. In a legal situation like this, the way it's done is you either represent yourself, you get your chief, local chieftain, your local Gothi, to represent you, or you hire a lawyer. Not only must you argue the case, you must argue the case using the correct words. He sought to ruin my reputation to cover up his poor trade. Boo. Get the ships and the rations. As far as this goes, the back and forth, me. while this is a modern format, True, uh, but what we're seeing here is I actually the, the right types of content. Self-aggrandizement, and then you go acknowledge that, and, Harold and then buff yourself up, you. right? You big yourself up. You don't have to deny the other person's How claim, you, you just have to one-up them. Anyway. Thorstein's reputation is restored, his position in Harald's good graces is too. Voila, quest one, complete. So when I talk about some of the quests being incredible, and at their best, on par with the best, with museum exhibitions, this is what I mean. We are getting into the Isle of Ely, in Anglo-Saxon Britain. By the way, they're also quietly not going to mention the Greek drawings, the uh, Greek imagery on these weirdly shaped pots. The scriptorium. In the scriptorium, uh, surrounded by parchment and quills, monks and nuns, known as scribes, worked on the, worked by the sweat of their brow to create, copy, and illuminate texts. Look at how good the art is. Uh, these little bars here uh, are up here, right? You can see all this like disfigurement and weird black stuff on these. 
This is probably Silver Leaf originally, uh, that has since corroded and damaged the parchment. Uh, so we have four humors, blood connected to air, controlling happiness and cheerfulness, yellow bile to fire, drove a person's anger and impulsiveness, black bile to earth for melancholy and anxiety, and phlegm connected to water for self-control and apathy. Uh, so from the basic materials of the creation to attributes to the movement of the planets, we have this great tradition. And a little bit more about the monastery of Ely. The founder and first abbess of Ely was Queen Athelfrith of Northumbria, depicted here. As an incredibly crotchety old woman, but wearing so much gold. Early medieval monasteries, though, were far more than just religious centers. Monasteries were also among the biggest local landowners, and by extension the biggest local employers. This is true if a bit capitalist. This entry is really good, and is a really important thing for conceiving of uh, monasteries. Monasteries are not isolated from a community, they're not uh, distinct from it, they are instead an integral part of the community space. I must not miss Prime. Yeah, but first we're gonna do this. So this one, this is a really well done entry that infuriates me to no end. We're gonna get heavy here, we're gonna get real heavy. Uh, so some sources allege that the Saxons, Angles, and Jutes, some sources meaning primarily Bede, were the three Germanic tribes who during the 5th and 6th century migrated to the ancient Roman provinces of Britannia, modern-day England, southern Scotland, and eastern Wales. It was once common in academia to group these peoples under the umbrella term Anglo-Saxons. The term Anglo-Saxon is flawed. It creates the illusion that there was some common ethnicity between the Germanic migrants when that wasn't necessarily the case. The part of the story that they are not saying here, the term Anglo-Saxony appears three times in the Old English Corpus. It appears in one additional time in the works of the Frankish Paul the Deacon. Though all three of those times are in Latin text, not Old English, and seem to be uh, largely existing as an aspirational term, sort of inventing out of nothing a shared English-Saxonness that could be used uh, to ostracize certain groups of people, including Welsh Celtic-speaking peoples uh, and Norse-speaking peoples. So it's used uh, once in a charter by Alfred the Great, and twice later under the reign of Athelstan or later. This is intentional, deliberate uh, work for ethnogenesis. In the modern period, the term as an academic thing uh, is first used in the 1830s and is immediately, from the beginning, used as a term of modern ethno-identification. That the Anglo-Saxon race are the white people who live in England. The ideas are floating around earlier, uh, someone like Thomas Jefferson really likes Hengist and Horsa, and he's like, okay, so right, the entire structure of Enlightenment white values and the English law owes itself to this time period. So these ideas are floating around earlier, super racist, super problematic. And so Anglo-Saxon becomes a really convenient term to do that. And it still is. It, uh, it, the problem is certainly worse in America, where we have the idea of the white Anglo-Saxon New England Protestant. And it, the problem still exists in England, contrary to the cries of conservative British academics. Uh, this is drawing on the work of Dr. Mary Rambrin Ohm, the work of uh, Dr. Adam Miyashiro, Dr. Eric Wade, and many others. All of these fabulous scholars are doing work uh, to break down the idea in the UK as well as in the US that Anglo-Saxon is in fact a racially charged term. It super is. Uh, it exploded in 2017 when Dr. Mary Rambrin Ohm uh, resigned in protest from the board of the International Society of Anglo-Saxonists uh, over the racism inherent in the academy and around the term. The International Society has since changed its name to the International Society for the Study of Early Medieval England. Here on this channel, we are 100% in agreement, meaning I am 100% in agreement with the arguments presented by Dr. Miyashiro, Dr. Rambrin Olm, and others regarding it. I support them and stand with them against the harassment they have received for daring to challenge the status quo and suggest that we can be better. So, 
This entry in this discovery tour is really good. The game will continue to use the term Anglo-Saxon throughout, despite knowing that it is a wrong, inaccurate, problematic term that has deep ties to racism in modernity and in the Middle Ages. At the time of the Vikings, not many people could read and write. This is true. Alfred the Great really hates this. Many of those who could were church officials, uh, create, create records in monasteries, most pre-conquest English. Hey, look at that! They're using my increasingly preferred term right here. Pre-conquest English. So, the English-speaking peoples who lived before the Norman Conquest. By these political motives may have helped to shape the church records, surprising literally no one. Vikings were pagan, or non-Christian, and the church disliked and often demonized pagans. Fair, but this account is actually more... This account is more complicated. So, even within these church records, we have accounts of counter-narratives, and that the account perceived is not as... Sister, not as clear I was wondering uh, as it suggests. Medical matter. Relics and saints. So, uh, saints connection with God grant them miraculous powers, well, they answer prayers, heal the sick, advocate for the faithful on earth, etc, etc. This is a really good one. And the reliquary that they're using throughout all of Aelrich's quests in the game, but they used the Winchester Reliquary, something made in this time period that was found in the royal site of Winchester. And there's, there's the reliquary right there. Uh, the reliquary probably isn't just put on the floor here, but that's okay. Parchment was made to last so its content could be carried from generation to generation. This quality was recognized in the Viking Age. Uh, this is true. Also, manuscript production. Uh, 12th century, from Germany, but this little moon-shaped knife is used to scrape the hair uh, off and smooth out the parchment, and then after that you can use a book knife to help cut the things to size. Meals here are supposed to be perfectly silent. We'll see how that goes. <coughs> Oswina, Oswina, <coughs> you're supposed to be silent here. There are rules about these things. All right, well, uh, you're dead. Peace. Tell me, Oswina, where does it hurt? Although early medieval medicine was strongly influenced by Christian and Greek and Roman and Galenic teachings, healing process didn't rely purely on prayers and miracles. Those who cared for the sick drew on classical er and local knowledge of herbs from many sources. Monasteries could grow herbs using these remedies and had the resources to create, compile, and consult medical manuscripts. Anyway, let's go consult some stuff. Scriptoria! Scriptoria! Hello, random scroll. Will you have the answers I seek? Anyway, this is one of my favorite manuscripts on the planet, and you'll see why. A copyist needed a lot of stamina and resolve to undertake the sacred task of writing. Hardship was intended to be part of the monastic life, and scribes were not supposed to vent their frustrations out loud. However, uh, they did. Uh, this 11th century manuscript, the complaint, God help me handum! God help my hands. And so now we gotta go all the way out of town, uh, out of the monastery, in order to go find some stuff for the various things. Dust from a relic, double brewed ale, honey, and fever fuel. Really good choices, right? This is a totally plausible remedy. Don't actually agree with this one so much. Uh, medieval Scandinavians may not have seen their attacks on monasteries as different from any other raid. I think this is wrong. I think the evidence is overwhelming that from the very beginning that they were familiar with monastic institutions and knew that monastic institutions had a lot of portable wealth. Magic and medicine. The church considered magical beliefs pagan and evil, again more complicated than that. Uh, so magic in the Middle Ages is neither pagan nor evil. It is an acceptable, recognized, I guess is a better word than acceptable, uh, part of the functioning of the world. Any bees around? Yeah, bees. They might have ale in the kitchens. That, that's the usual place to keep ale, yes. Well, guess what? They won't show it on screen. But you are correct, that is exactly what happened. What is happening? Quest 1, the raid that Harald, well, a subsequent raid that Furstein uh, did while with Harald, uh, is in fact the raid right now that is attacking the Isle of Ely. Look at the Winchester rel reliquary here. This is this is basically the same reconstruction as the Hampton Trust uh, has gone for, their best guess reconstruction, and they just ported it straight into the game, and it's fabulous. Uh, and so it's implied that this uh, raid completely destroys 
the Isle of Ely, and the monastic community there. This is the only place where I think they severely overstate their case in the entire, uh, in the entire questline. In that certainly depop total depopulation happened, but very often, uh, Right, some place like Lindisfarne was actually able to withstand about 70 years worth of raiding before they moved. Uh, we are interacting with Harald Harfara, or uh, Harald Feinherr, I should say, and we are going to be building a boat in this quest. By the way, what he is using is a tile harp, uh, a boat harp. Uh, to carry out the task of uh, skaldic poetry, the skald composed poems that followed a complex set of rules. When they say complex here, they are understating things actually fairly ridiculously. Skaldic poetry, particularly in the meter of Durotkvite, uh, or court verse, alliterated, had internal rhyme, had end rhyme, and every four lines, a stanza has eight lines in skaldic poetry. Uh, there's a metrical like number of syllables in the line, and every four lines had to be a complete semantic thought with the second line relating to the first line. Absolute travesty of a meter, but the good thing about it is that the meter means that we know with a high degree of certainty that some of the poems preserved in late medieval manuscripts in Iceland actually date to the very early Middle Ages. Also, I need to go over here. Quick, out of my way. Out of my way, I got places to be, things to do, people to talk to. The Great Hall. A Great Hall, or Salur, which is the correct word, is a sight to behold. A Great Hall may have been its own building, like the one pictured here. This one is from the Lofoden Islands. This is the farmhouse at Borg which is the largest uh, longhouse we have ever found. So, the history of King Harald's fair hair is as fabulous as it is dubious. Facts and myths are very much entwined in the accounts of his life. Unfortunately, right, the first really detailed account of his life is from Snorri Sturluson, the author of the Prose Edda, and it's completely unreliable, just like Inglinga Saga, Norse religion. This is... This is gonna be a complicated entry. Unlike the Christians, the Vikings did not have a clergy. A select, group of, uh, a select group or institution who presided over religious rituals. People of different ages, genders, and backgrounds could officiate Scandinavian rituals. Primarily, the ones we're looking at are the Gothi, uh, the chieftainship, uh, which overlaps with the category of like the Yach, or cognate to English Earl, uh, so our lay chieftains are also religious chieftains, and then you have people like the Spaukona or the Völva uh, that are kind of female practitioners, particularly for burial rituals, divination, etc., that are really influential there. To bring it all the way the clan. Okay, several households come together to form a clan or Aht. These bonds could be cemented via blood relations, marriage, or by an oath made during a legal assembly. Really good. This is really good. The name of an Aht would often be constructed by putting together the name of a notorious forefather or a god with the suffix Ingur. The other way of naming a clan, by the way, though, is after the physical location where they are. His love for you flows deep, but its pull is as strong as the tides. I oh, see you've made good the phrasing on your here is another one. Is least. another one that's phenomenal. This group of a small thing that they're uh, uh, phrasing it enough. specifically in terms of love. Uh, they mention, anyway, that King Harald and Thorstein shared love, and love in a non-romantic sense, probably, most of the time, maybe. But framing it in terms of love and affection is extremely well attested in the sagas and in medieval literature broadly. Uh, Scandinavians first began to use sails on their ships in the 7th or 8th century, this is true, where once they relied solely on oars, they now introduced the famous squared sail in this runestone. Additionally, though, uh, the part in, that I wish they had put into that entry, in addition to the amount of wool required, is the amount of labor. And this is labor that is done overwhelmingly by women. Women's labor is integral to the Viking phenomenon, and histories of the Viking phenomenon have a nasty habit of just like, oh yeah, sales got introduced, move on. So, the process that's being outlined here is actually our best reconstruction. You know, the use of planes, uh, wedges to split the wood straight, uh, into these long planks, the uh, etc. Taboos on the high seas. Okay. 
Uh, a good way to ward off bad luck on an expedition was be familiar with all the taboos before setting sail. They will elaborate on this more later, and will do things that are, as far as I have been able to find in my research, straight up wrong. That being said, the idea that there are taboos and omens associated with going to sea uh, marks that there are times when you shouldn't, right? An omen happens on the way to the boat, you should just call off the whole thing, be done, and if you don't, it's going to be bad. They're being deliberately vague, and that is notable because our survival of what those taboos were, or what that actually means, is um, extremely limited. The long skip. To build a longship, one first had the keel, the backbone of the ship, to the hull. The hull was clinker built. The planks overlapped each other like fish scales. The boards were fastened together by metal rivets, then caulked by hemp and horsehair soaked in tar. Or the mast was attached to the hull by a fish shaped piece of wood. And this ensured that the sail along the mast did not re resist the wind, but did move with it. Adaptability made the long skip elastic, rather than splitting the waves, it slithered through them. It also split the waves sometimes, but you know. Uh, it is an incredibly seaworthy piece of thing for having a draft as low as one meter, right? As shallow as one meter, which is incredibly dangerous in deep water, the thing is incredibly seaworthy. And ships, between two worlds. Ancient Scandinavians believed that ships traveled two different worlds, if they were built on land but lived at sea. Symbolically, to sail was to have a foot in two worlds, not just land and sea, but also life and death. To be on a ship was to be in a liminal in-between space between life and afterlife. This is a case of being a little bit strong in their interpretation. There are definitely cases where this is true. Can we elaborate that to all sailing vessels? I do not think so. And that can we elaborate that to every time people went to sea in a dominantly maritime culture to say that that is pulling them into the other world? I do not think so. There's definitely elements of this, but there's also a lot of evidence that going to sea is perceived as a perfectly mundane lay activity that you did and had lay risks associated with. Figureheads, as seen here, were often sculpted onto wild an into wild animals or monsters. They were not just decorations that attended to frighten the protected spirits or land vaitir of hostile territories. Uh, this is derived from a saga source, specifically Olaus Saga Tregvasar. Uh, when the Vikings wanted to ensure a successful military or commercial expedition, they showed the ship's figurehead as they drew near the shore to intimidate the land vaitir of their rivals and enemies. When they were visiting a uh, friendly territory, the uh, Vikings did not to offend or frighten the local spirits. On these occasions, they would remove the figurehead from the prow for a less threatening arrival. This is literally entirely from Olaf Saga Tregosvara. So, we've got one more thing to do, and that's choose a prow for our boat. We've got a few options here. As you can see, we've got three here. The elk, or elker. Uh, the elk, which by the way should refer to a moose. The elk's antlers re both resemble tree branches and were symbolically connected to them. Just like leaves, the antlers would fall only to be reborn, as associated with the cycle of life uh, according to Algis, which according to the Icelandic rune poem is the rune of the elk. And that's what its name is, right? Algis is the Proto-Norse word for elker, uh, elk. The snake, or ormur. Snakes were well represented in Scandinavian magical etc. associated with deaths. Under the ground was Nidhugger. Uh, d a winged snake, actually, that strove to devour the roots of Yggdrasil. It was not uncommon for these monstrous snakes to pass into legend as dragons. Thing is, this is a bad way. Of this sentence, this sentence is extremely bad. It is not that they pass into legend as dragons, because that implies that they were once something that wasn't dragons. Ormer and Draki are the same thing. They are completely interchangeable words. Anyway, last one: the horse or Hester. Horses were known for transporting people and goods. Scandinavians also transport granted them the power to move between the worlds of the living and the dead. Sleipnir could carry the uh, Alfather between worlds. As could, like most horses, uh, Hermother uses just a random ass horse when he goes to the underworld uh, after Baldur's death. So, connections are drawn between horses. No, this is not why in skaldic poetry connections were drawn between horses and boats. They're drawn because it's the primary mode of transport. You ride a horse on land, you ride in a boat on the sea, therefore a boat is a horse of the land, or a horse of the sea. Unjo. The rule of kinship. No. And no. Why not? Uh, well, no man okay, has been fine, but no. Uh, I'd rather see a longer inscription. It's been an honor. To... 
Anyway, the navigator. Anyone could learn to sail, but every Norse crew had one person who was especially skilled. Uh, often, the navigator is also the person financing the expedition, or related to the person financing the expedition. For this, given that we are not super duper wealthy, uh, we are instead trying to hire one. The sea, a spiritual being. For ancient Scandinavians, the ocean was more than a massive body of water, it was a spiritual entity in its own right, as well as a world in itself. Mostly the latter, I think. Uh, treating it as a spiritual entity is kind of weird. Uh, treating it uh, as another world is more valid. Also, Trig, our enslaved person. Uh, he's, dead, he's a dead slave rather than a captured slave, but so be it. Are you sure I can't tempt you to come with us? Your help would be invaluable. Shackles here versus shackles across the sea? Tough choice to make. Oh, you misunderstand me. I free you, here and now. Let's get these supplies on board. This, this is a out. actually pretty plausible thing. Uh, right, the idea that you might manumit someone uh, right before uh, or after some amount of time of service, or you might manumit their children and not them or something. Okay, so this is a funky one. And the bad luck they could bring upon sailors was so serious that it was forbidden to mention their names aboard their ship or even cross their paths on the way to the shore. Matter of fact, modern archaeology has proven that horses and other taboo animals were included in Scandinavian expeditions, such as the Icelandic settlement. This reality might seem to suggest that taboo against mentioning or ferrying farm animals aboard a ship was not taken seriously. However, when it comes to studying the beliefs of ancient cultures, it helps to be cautious. My practices, which were logical at the time, may seem to be contradictory from modernity. So if one suggests that maritime taboos were at once logical and real for Scandinavian peoples, one needs to consider other archaeological discoveries in that context. Uh, one possibility that could account for the existence of animal taboos and the archaeological evidence of horses aboard ships that taboos could be ritually challenged, blah blah blah, weather directions in the shape of a horse. So, this is funky. I consulted with several people and all of my own research, and I could find zero evidence that horses were considered taboo. Freyr, gods, let this horse bring balance no, no, and protection no, no. to our See, journey. Gunhilda, the prayer should be, uh, Frere, I demand that you use this horse to Mother bring us protection. Happy to see me. Dividing the spoils. Uh, biggest piece of the pie went to the owner, uh, sometimes it's a captain or steer, steer another, but it didn't have to be. This is true. Our people helped to pay for the expedition. Wealth will be distributed according to the scale of the investment. Yup. Yup. Uh, notably, by the way. Uh, this runestone was erected by a son to honor his father and crew, all of whom were lost at sea. As you might guess from the cross, as you might guess from the cross, late 11th, early 12th century. This is post-Viking. This is potentially still a raiding voyage into the Baltic. This might also be for a trade voyage. I don't know this runestone specifically. I didn't look it up. I saw you on the path earlier. Again, as I said earlier, course, this is completely, as far as I was able to I tell, did. completely fabrication, fabricated off of nothing. The idea, though, us. that sailing with a Have woman is taboo guy? is somewhat better attested. So, we've gone through all the unfortunate parts, right? We've gone through all the unfortunate parts of this quest of bad things, doing bad stuff, um, making no sense. There's little to stand in your now I get one of my favorite sky. sections of the entire Discovery Tour, right here, right now. Clan will accompany us. This is a thing I adore about this, right? The directions up here, the quest markers. There is no... Go to the mark on the map. Straight ahead towards the setting sun. This is precisely our best guess as to how navigation worked, based on landmarks, stars, loho features, and it was an th important thing. Uh, a mark of a good navigator was being able to see a bit of coastline and go like, "We are here. This is what you must do to get to where we want to go," with high precision. Our destination is ahead. This is Haloya. You shouldn't be. Oh yeah, by the way, Bjorn, brother, you know, the guy we got outlawed, he just moved, like, brother. a district. When have we ever been brothers? Moved, like, one island over. We were in the camp, you trust that not everyone is deceitful? No, no, he can't. Take me to your ship, then, and we'll leave this wretched place. We now skip ahead to after the main plot of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So, specifically, they're focusing here a lot on the Battle of Eddington and its aftermath, including Vothram's uh, conversion to Christianity. 
There may be something to this religion of yours after. Okay, so this is a really cool uh, throwaway, uh, even though it's not one I think is executed particularly well, because uh, Anders Vinrot suggests that one of the main goal uh, reasons why uh, Christianization in Scandinavia was so top down is that Christian models of authority uh, have better structures to accommodate power and the formation of kingdoms instead of chief small chieftainships than the highly disjointed, disparate, decentralized set of Norse religions provided. Uh, unexpected circumstances would occasionally force Viking sailors to find a place to spend the winter, though seek shelter in a small cove or river islands way out the cold. These uh, o overwintering sites could become permanent outposts like Emporia, villages, or even major cities, as seen in this map. This is actually super wrong! Overwintering was very common. Uh, Multi-year campaigns uh, since the 860s all the way through to the like 920s, basically you have constant forces overwintering. Scouts before the storm. Before invading a territory, it is important for the would-be conquerors to learn the lay of the land. According to the 789 article of the so-called Anglo-Saxon Chronicles seen here, the first Viking raid on Anglo-Saxon soil took place many decades before the advent of the Great Heathen Army. So, this is bad. This is this is a problem. Uh, as we read this, I won't read the rest of it. But uh, effectively, they're arguing that the 789 raid, which is the first one attested uh, multiple years before the Lindisfarne raid, even, uh, was a prelude and scouting expedition for the uh, great Viking army of the 860s. There is precisely zero evidence and far and nothing that m remotely resembles logic uh, to be associated with that. Okay. Uh, not all Vikings were warlike if riches could be acquired without combat. Scandinavians would happily take that route. Even the warlike ones would take that route because not dying, right? Uh, even Halvamel says this. Not dying is good. The idea, this is buying into a narrative wherein they are suggesting, without ever explicitly saying, that Vikings are kind of super soldiers, right? They have a, such a genius tactical mind that they play 5D chess while everyone else is playing 1D chess, right? No. Whenever there's a fair fight, there's about a 60% chance the Vikings will lose that fight. Their, their tactics were heavily involved trying to avoid fights. Christianization. There's a difference between conversion and Christianization. In conversion, one could recognize Christ as divine and... Well, that blurb is wrong. It's possible that Christianization uh, certainly began prior to their arrival in England. Many Vikings came from places where they would have encountered Christian ideas and perhaps absorbed them. The Vikings' familiarity with Christianity might have smoothed their quick assimilation into English populations. We have been betrayed, bamboozled, tricked, and deceived. The conversion uh, and longer term Christianization uh, is done both through uh, senses of agreement, uh, such as with Iceland in 999 or 1000, I'm searching for uh, and also through uh, individual chieftains sort of imposing that, as with Harald. Certainly not. Uh, Harold Bluetooth, etc. Gotherum, Gotherum, we found the, we found the problem. I found the missing gold and the relic of Ely. I told you to return to your cell, Elrich. I will not brook disobedience, not from my men. Now what are you gonna you. do? Kill me? You are no longer. So Gotherum has now. Uh, Thank you, my lord. I will remember you in my prayers. Has now surrendered, moment, and so uh, hostages are freed. The insights I gleaned into the Saxon mind through our discussions made Alfred's terms easier to swallow. This is important. This is true in Scandinavia as well as in England. Christianization does not change the idea that peace is a temporary thing in a society founded on endemic violence. This is true throughout the Middle Ages, throughout the early modern period. This is broadly true in particularly Latin medieval Europe, uh, but really in a lot of pre-modern societies cross-culturally, it is true that this is a really, really important thing. Of The idea of peace as the complete absence of war is very modern. The Truce of Wedmore. Uh, following the liturgical instructions, Gwildrum and the baptized Vikings wore the white robes of those newly reborn at the royal estate of Wedmore. 
uh, the Vikings rejoined Alfred for 12 days of feasting. So it's in the so-called Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the Vita Alfredi, and the so-called Treaty of Alfred and Wuthrum. And isn't the main probably correct? Probably pretty close to what happened. But of course, as it says nicely, a little bit of source criticism. It's not to share the truth, but to contribute to the making of an exemplary Christian king helps to be cautious and critical. After all, all of these d documents were demanded and sponsored by Alfred the Great. So he's upping himself in this. Anyway, who's right to talk about weapons? 200 unique weapon models were designed for AC Valhalla. Some of these axes aren't horrible. Uh, this one in the center right here is probably the good one. I can live with some of these ones, but oh boy, those flails. While big two-handed wheat threshing flails are used by peasants in harvest, they are not one-handed, they do not have poison clouds, they do not have random balls of bullshit. Battle at Edington. Uh, incredibly well-known battle. They are very confident in their reconstruction here. They should not be this confident. We don't even know where the battle, where Edington precisely is. We've got a rough idea that somewhere down here, but we don't actually know. Onwards into Winchester. But anyway, the boar. Some boars were built atop existing Roman walls and fortresses, while others, there's a third category here. Uh, those that were built on top of Iron Age forts, uh, then some were built from scratch. And powerful social centers, safe havens, etc. Likely the boars have a way to communicate and warn each other of danger. A boar such as this one, very Roman design. Uh, but under attack, you might light up a beacon to put the other strongholds on alert and ensure that the reinforcements would arrive from two directions within a couple of days. The way to know the counselors, they act a lot like they act a lot like the thing. So this is actually a really late idea of the Witan becoming the royal court. Uh, in the 7th and 8th centuries, the Witan is a far more uh, communal area. And so a local Witan could be basically the governing body for uh, Lundenwich, the Emporia of London. As England consolidates, uh, the Witan functions far more as described here than the Witan as a set of councillors within the royal court. Okay, on English literature. Alfred wanted to be remembered as a good Christian king. He was bothered by his people's ignorance of the Bible and felt their poor Latin was to blame. To solve this, he pushed to have Latin classics translate into Old English. This gave rise to the birth of Old English li literature. I disagree with this last sentence in particular. To say that it gave rise to the birth of Old English literature is not just objectively not true. Uh, Beowulf linguistically uh, dates at least in part to the middle of the 8th century, almost a hundred years before Alfred was born. Fox the gift of life. East Anglia. So it says here East Anglia, right, Alfred gave Guthrum East Anglia. East Anglia was not Alfred's to give, he wasn't the king of East Anglia. The thing is, while the treaty of Alfred and Guthrum does phrase it as a gift, in practicality, what I think is more likely is that Gwodrum retreated to lands that were securely in his control. Let us delay this happy occasion no longer. So I once again don't super duper love this. Uh, right, they're they're playing up out Al they're bigging up Alfred quite a lot. The the early English sources from Wessex big up Alfred enough. We don't need to do that. What is true is that Alfred makes himself Gwodrum's godfather which provides an additional kinship responsibility uh, and layer of things that Gwodrum would have recommend, right? Gwodrum would have associated this probably with a foster parent uh, and understood it for what it was meant to be, which is pretty clearly uh, Alfred exerting some sort of extra kinship and extra uh, superiority over Gwodrum. So this game really leans hard into the idea of Alfred as the generator of, Eng of English identity. It's worth noting that Alfred is not 
Alfred is the first person to make these claims, uh, but more modern evidence, more modern analyses uh, very clearly suggest that he failed at this, uh, and his conception of a more unified Englishness is something that takes place uh, over the next approximately 70 years after Alfred's reign. Anyway, treaty with Gwildrum. The other thing that this treaty does, uh, fix the boundaries of the Danelaw, determine the equivalence of freemen from both sides in terms of their compensation. True. It says this treaty did not put an end to Scandinavian raiding activities. It also did not put an end to pre-conquest English raiding activities into the Danelaw. Thanes are companions and retainers of people, such as the king, etc, etc. Uh, note, Thane is in a concept in Old Norse as well. It simply refers to a relatively noble person. The heathens are less likely to notice our fortifications if the walls we build them on have been what? there all along. What? <laughs> I didn't process that sentence. But no, it is not Alfred playing 5D chess, it is that the Romans picked good locations, and with the foundations already done, it is easier to build up the site. The city of Winchester. Well, what's really important is this last paragraph. Uh, it is becomes associated with the royalty of Wessex, and it ends up therefore being an extremely important site, just on principle. As King Alfred is an historical figure, artists and modelers had a lot of documentation to help with his design. He suffered from Crohn's disease. This is a this common interpretation, was made but the I want to give of his, clothes, uh, of his illness, and facial features. but I need to give the, the usual uh, seen up close disclaimer in multiple well, as a professional historian that you try really hard these days so to avoid so diagnosing historical figures with his specific diseases. But these days, we simply say he suffered from some sort of chronic illness. Alfred, thank you for waiting. Chairs or Freeman, uh, which we, we get the modern English word churlish from this, but it's any free man. Uh, so you have enslaved people, you have unenslaved people. Chairs are unenslaved people, but there is wide amounts of uh, discrepancies between them. Anyway, let's go into the church. I will see that your daughter is well taken care This is good, right? This part is good. This is in accordance with the law codes of the Alfred's Lord court. You and keep Though, you know, giving the classic, the uh, like, new revised standard version benediction is gracious to you. Protestant. Amen. Apparently you're fine now. Uh, cool. Okay. You are a good Bye. King. Uh, Alfred is in many, really, really seems to be genuinely pious and does a lot of social programs, etc. And, you know, uh, being the local lord, uh, taking care of orphans, etc., was his responsibility. So that's good. Uh, Alfred, of course, paid tribute to the Vikings. It, his own the sources from Wessex say he paid tribute to the Vikings. This isn't really a controversial idea. Of course he is. Look at this little bit of glorification. He was the first to successfully free himself and his people from the constraints imposed by foreign rulers. This is a little bit of our garbage. This is a little bit of hot... Hot garbage rolling in around here. This praises the imposition of foreign rule upon Englishness, upon English people, as an aberration and as something that requires liberation from. In other words, it casts the uh, Viking phenomenon as akin to settler colonialism and acts of colonial resistance uh, being good and worthy of glorification. I've seen my right. vision come to it life. is enough to say that Alfred did free himself. Well. We do not need to make That's the judgment the of this of is good. Must build as many birds, right, that it is a feat worthy of respect, and that he did something land, grand with each of for strongholds overseen by trained proper men, English identity. Able to protect right. us when the... We've reached the bishop's residence. This is where I leave you. Anyway, bishops. TLDR, uh, bishops are simultaneously uh, the local religious authority and are appointed by secular kings uh, lay investiture is what's this called in and is the norm in this period and so were appointed and expected to participate 
uh, in lay secular society and lay secular functioning. What brings you to Winchester? King Alfred seeks the Lord's support to implement his laws with the nobles. Noble man, what say you? Well, despite my doubts, I will not go against our Lord's thank wishes. You. We get to play as what Alfred. Have you got in mind? Yeah, let's talk about this. Alfred and the English. So, the idea of the Anglican, all the English race and the people which are in East Anglia. So, you know, basically, Alfred aspirationally in the treaty tries to establish an ethno group of the English people from Cornwall across southern England up through Mercia. This is entirely aspirational. He is not successful at generating this identity. Uh, in fact, it's unclear the extent to which Alfred cared about common people recognizing that identity versus the elite uh, power structures of his day. Anyway, Alfred's legacy has been secured. Uh, so as I said, the Burgle Hidaj is a manuscript that details the list of books or fortifications that were uh, spread around, uh, mostly along the Thames, uh, from this project that Alfred did. It is quite, uh, quite an impressive document. I'm surprised it didn't get brought up in any of the discovery points here. Uh, but it is super cool and shows that his uh, actions did result in a big network of fortifications. Now, let's go over to Jorvik and look at trade in the Viking Age and commerce. By the way, we are. This is the other quest where I think this game, this discovery tour, I should say, uh, lives up to the potential it has as a digital museum. Naming the world. So, uh, selection locations in, from early medieval England whose names have their origins in Old Norse. Uh, Anglo Saxons named the cities and towns before the Vikings arrived and continued to rename them long after the Vikings settled. So, Eberakum is Eoferwich, is Jorvik is York. Uh, after his capture by the Vikings, Jorvik uh, grew quickly in land, wealth, and people, and became a center of commercial power. Note, it is worth knowing that despite Jorvik, uh, or Eoferwich, being significantly smaller than North Jorvik, it still was an important site for the Northumbrian Witan and the civil strife going on when the uh, Great Viking Army lands in the 860s. There's actually a civil war going on in Northumbria, and so they're kind of able to just mop up both kings. Slavery! You know, you were asking about it. Even though Christianity opposed slavery in theory, there were many, many enslaved people. By the way, I don't like their language. Uh, these are not, this is not very inclusive language, and this is not very decolonial, decolonial language. So, enslaved people to foreground the fact that they are people. Enslaved people uh, worked in both Anglo-Saxon and Scandinavian communities uh, in farming, construction, and more. While enslaved people did not have legal rights, uh, some might be able to save enough money to buy their freedom. Wilfera does a lot of conversion work in the 9th century. Uh, powerful English people rubbed shoulders with powerful Scandinavians. This gave them the chance to introduce Christian ideas to pagan chieftains. And I don't love this one. Uh, in fact, it's extremely likely that many of them had encountered Christians before. And the thing that's not mentioned in that blurb is the negative pressure, right? A lot of the positive pressure, people getting a chance to talk with them, persuade them, interact with them. And what's not a lot being said is like trade restrictions, uh, social ostracization, uh, the pres public performance of Christian rituals in a relatively obnoxious way, uh, negative pressures to encourage people to convert to be able to participate in these aspects of life. This gravestone is known as a hogback design, which some of these hogback designs have this little hatch pattern, which is how we know that wooden shingles were used on longhouses in early medieval England and Scandinavia. Let's get going into Coppergate. Look how cool Coppergate is. And the Scandinavian fashion. Wool is used and then linen. Silk had to be brought all the way from the Eastern Roman Empire and uh, China, etc. They had different fashion styles, this is true, and this is the brooch of Pitney is 
a gorgeous, gorgeous example. Anyway, Coppergate. From every corner of the world, craftsmen, craftswomen, potters, weavers, silversmiths, blacksmiths, leathersmiths, bread makers, glass makers, cum makers, sculptors of wood, horn, antler, stone, bone, and more, etc., etc., etc. So many things. And hey, look, it's Trig. Freed and a business partner. How are Trig you doing? Started unloading without me, I see. If you don't want me to sweat so much, you can help me move this wares to our stall. I, give I wish they glammed up Trick's uh, outfit a little bit to represent the fact that he's been no a free man for 14 with. years now. Uh, he, he could be dressed far better. She brought me to our Lord and Savior. Also, Trick converted. Uh, Bardring and Hacksilver. So, you know. Would have negotiated my hens, you could get exchange for three walrus tusks. A lot of hens, by the way. The correct answer to that is a lot. Uh, practice of silver hacking. So, when you get your hands on silver, you break them up. Because the large objects are not useful, but small pieces of silver are, of relatively known weight. And then you can melt hack silver down into a bullion. And stone sculptures. Sculpted stone, uh, in order to do stuff. About 400 Anglo-Scandinavian stone sculptures were erected between the 9th and 11th centuries, suggests that the Danelaw's population were growing and becoming wealthier to afford these. True. Some of these are both Christian and non-Christian symbols. Uh, for instance, the cross features both a crucified Christ and some of these like knotwork patterns that are stereotypically uh, pre-Christian Scandinavian. Hello. I would like to commission a rune stone. Commemorate many years of happiness and success. Also, this is adorable. A fine choice with many options to choose what you want engraved on your room stone. Something romantic, something classical, something cheeky. Love me. I love you, Gunhild. Kiss me. I know you would. Something classical. Love conquers all. Let us too. Citing his Roman love. authors. Sometimes Aren't you proud of Thorstein? He's become so educated. Gunhilda loved. I was in Stava. Since she loves you still, it must be some loving indeed. Uh, is this, this last one, by the way, is actually attested uh, in a runic inscription from medieval Norway, or from Viking Age Norway. A new mixed identity. The church often framed the world in black and white, the big Christians and heathens both fighting a raging war for the supremacy of their beliefs, though the truth is much more nuanced. Indeed. Heathens and Christians uh, managed to overcome their differences, coming together as people living under the same rulers and sharing the same land. This is true. Let us go the fastest way across the water. Whee! You need to take a walk. The cross and the hammer. The slow merging of Christian and pagan beliefs can be seen in these two artifacts. This pendant of Thor's hammer has been decorated with a Christian cross right in the center there. Uh, the person who wore it likely had some blend of beliefs. Also, the mold has been carved to do both a Mjolnir pendant and Christian cross pendants. It's able to do both. Uh, this is from this is from Riba, I believe. Hey, look, it's Ailrich. They got to meet and hang out. Aren't they cute? Here, where Edith's mother and father are buried, may they give their blessing to this holy union. Love never fails. This is a very Trig, modern uh, you wedding ceremony. Be your wife here in the sight right, of this is a very modern Savior one. This does not seem to line up particularly I well do. with early English wedding customs, Edith, but that's okay. Do you like, take let's be Trig honest, be it's husband. okay. Uh, marriage is a political institution, but love does get to play a role. In this last case, a marriage between Christians and heathens would require the conversion and baptism of the non-Christian party. I agree, right, the idea that marriages were a driving force for change uh, is one of very, very, very many, but, you know, it is. I fear they want to do more than talk, brother. My husband and I are on our way home. This won't take long, I promise. There is one really good uh, last moment here before we get into it, so let's highlight this one. Thorstein has disappeared and Gunhilda is bereft. As the days turn to years, she has only one goal, to discover her husband's fate and, if necessary, to avenge him. This is good. This is attested from saga narratives. 
uh, the women of the household uh, should recruit people to assist in attempting to figure out what happened in what appears to be a murder. Right, this appears to be a killing of some kind, and therefore, as the closest surviving family member, while uh, Gunhilda herself does not have the authority to prosecute the case herself or to enact vengeance, it is her responsibility to recruit people to assist her with that and make sure that justice is served. We are in for a very, very, very wild ride. Where am I? Jotunheim, land of the giants. Loki the trickster. Of all the Scandinavian deities, Loki was the most chaotic and unpredictable. With his cunning intelligence, tremendous magical powers, and shape-shifting abilities, he could do whatever he wanted. One teeny tiny problem, folks. There is virtually zero evidence to indicate that Loki was ever worshipped. From this, I think it is reasonable to conclude that Lo Loki's status as a deity that was worshipped emerges in the late Viking Age, after the time period of this game. As far as this account in this one, uh, this is primarily out of the prose, uh, the prose epilogue to the a poem Lokasena created in the Orkney Islands in the 12th century, uh, but also uh, the account given by Snorri Sturluson, uh, the Icelandic law speaker, politician, and feuder, Thor, God of Thunder. Point number two. The, the, this entry, as far as it goes, is good. The problem, the problem, is God of Thunder. No mythological source says that he causes lightning, or that the sound of his, the, ch the wheels of his wagon are uh, thunder or anything of the sort. It is the most popular popular misconception. Eat yourself! Uh, so they have talked a lot in previous entries in the Discovery Tour, uh, is that Yggdrasil is said to be the tree of cosmos, or the cosmic tree. Pre-Christian Norse religions have no conception of cosmos. That is a Greek idea, that is not a Norse idea. So it actually is it. Uh, Gisli Sigurdsson provides what I think is the most plausible interpretation, and the one that revives an old idea with uh, a Giants. lot more care, care. He proposes that it is the Milky Way, and some of the beings that live in it are constellations in the Milky Way. The Giants. In Norse mythology, the very first being was Ymir. He was created when the fires of Muspech and the ice of Niflheim melted into each other. The race of giants, the Yetnar, are said to have been born from the sweat of Ymir's armpits, also from his feet having sex with each other. D don't ask questions, it's better if you don't think about it. So, they consistently use the term giants, uh, the word Yotun means devourer. It doesn't mean giant. They are also not large at this point. Uh, the Prose Edda is the first text to describe a supersized giant. However, uh, the traditional idea of a giant comes to us from modern folklore. Everything you thought you knew about the nobility of the What's Vikings is What's your problem with those giants? They seem pretty peaceful to me. They belittled me! Oh, then traded his eye to Mimir. This is the version of the story in the Prose Edda. In, uh, Snorri, Snorri also wrote uh, Heimskringla, including Inglinga Saga. And in Inglinga Saga, the story is a bit different. Mimir is killed by the Vanir, uh, thinking that the Aesir had tricked them in the exchange of hostages after their battle. And uh, Odin then preserves Mimir's head using uh, garlic and other herbs, and then consults with it in times of great need. No mention of sacrificing things for it, no mention of any of that. Now, he certainly is not this gargantuan. Enter, Thorstein of Midgard. I know what you seek. Also, though, given that the Reveal only sacrifice, sacrifice known to Mimis Brunner is Odin giving his eye, uh, which is very past. symbolically loaded, right? Oh, He's giving up a, one of his physical eyes in order sacrifice. to gain foresight, right? He gains vision by sacrificing vision. 
So uh, this is a very uh, ontologically Reaching significant the sacrifice. The idea that this is tr turned into just sacrifice something and get some answer in return is a complete fabrication out of modern media. And there is no evidence for this being a belief that anyone in medieval Viking Age Scandinavia would have understood. The Old Norse idea of self. So, here we are on Hammer. Personality and consciousness. Uh, the hammer is the external self, the appearance and the shape, manifesting the Hygr, ideally. Another entity attached to the human spirit was the Filgia. There is an animal Filgia, who is often associated uh, with an individual, uh, and being able to see your own Filgia, or to see other people's Filgia in the form of wolves, was usually a sign you were about to die. Then there is the Filgukona, a different idea tied up with the household uh, gods or Deesir. So, these sort of uh, female household deities uh, are closely related to the Filgukona as well, which seems to be more related to what this Discovery Tour accused of being the Hamingya. Some among the dead, i.e. those that were slain, were chosen to enter the Golden Paradise of Ausgardhar was in part because they lived an honorable life. This is also fair. Uh, in Ausgardhar, there are two places they could find rest. The first is Valhot, the Hall of the Slain, or by Oven. Uh, the second is Folkvanger, the people field. In this place, it seems that uh, Freya, who is, is said to be gods of love in the prose Edda, so I won't complain too much, but the, uh, contemporary, uh, contemporary evidence from the Viking Age is more ambiguous about. This is fabrication. The extent of the mentions of, Fol of Folkvanger is from the Eddic poem Grimnismal, probably from the 10th century, uh, supposedly it's all been talking. And Folkvanger is one of that list of halls in the, of the gods. That is it. To us gods, death is only part of an endless cycle of rebirth. Until Ragnarok My notes say, uh, damn it, cycle bullshit. The idea, well, right, this idea that gets thrown around on the internet somewhat regularly, uh, that like uh, Norse is cosmology is cyclical and Norse time is cyclical, Loki's. creation, destruction, creation, I destruction, creation, destruction, creation, destru destruction. It is not. In the it is fairly linear. Yeah, creation <laughs> builds up Your to Ragnarok, the only of the life. gods to die there. before Ragnarok are Baldur and Hörder. They ride towards the well of Urdur where the Norns weave the threads of destiny. The Iron Will of Fate. Fate was considered the most powerful force in the cosmos. No cosmos here. This magical self-conscious flow of energy linking everything and everyone together. No, this isn't Final Fantasy VII, this isn't the life stream. What is true is that the Nornir are weaving, like the Amoirai of Greek myth, uh, are weaving people's destinies, and those threads might be close together on the tapestry of history, and other times might spread very far apart, and always eventually get, uh, cut out. Prescribed by fate was unyielding. It, fair. Uh, men's gods and, uh, various monsters, whether as individuals or members of a clan, had to bend to the will of fate. No one could alter it, and everyone had to accept it. S Ragnarok exists, it is the ultimate fate, uh, it is the prophecy of the CRS and the end of every pro uh, prophecy. Oh! The destiny of every being was intertwined, their fates knit, knit together. This tapestry of life was wo woven by the Nornir, the keepers of fate. Legends said that they lived in the well of Urther, the well of fate. This mysterious place could be found under one of the roots of the world tree. So, we need to distinguish here between capital N, Nornir, and lowercase n Nornir. There are three capital N Nornir. Urder, Verhandi, and Skuld. Their well, uh, they are in charge of caring for Idrisid, uh, watering it each day. Uh, and their well is where the gods hold court. Then there are the small n Nornir. And so all the different types of beings in the world will have their own Nornir. And if someone has is born with poor luck, it is said that that can be the work of a wicked Nornir who wove a bad pattern for that person. Odin, the Allfather. Odin was the leader and chief of the gods. He presided over many domains, 
Domains are a flawed concept for Old Norse religion, uh, but magic poetry ruins death victory. Highly intelligent, he was probably not to be disobeyed. He's also the creator of the world, which is what gives him the name Allfather, because he is the guy who creates everything, including people! So he is the creator of humanity, he is the shaper of the world from Emir's corpse, and it's for those reasons, not because he's a peeping Tom, that he is called Allfather, along with very, 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 very many other names. The Nine Realms. My note here is you know the drill. You'll love to see it. Eigdrasik was nearly symmetrical. Its branches were as long as its roots, and they touch almost touched in a circle. The circular quality symbolized order and eternity. This is coming out of 19th century neo-pagan tree of life imageries, not at all anything that we can maybe possibly kind of argue at all is a medieval depiction of Eigdrasik. The highest of the nine realms was Ausgarder, placed in Eigdrasik other branches. This is true that was home to the Aesir, including Odin and Thor. The lowest realm nested among Angersil's roots was Helheim. Not Helheim, it's never called Helheim, Hel. Hel, singular. No Heim attached. Just Hel. The land of the dead, governed by the goddess Hel. Right in the middle of Yggdrasil was Midgardr, or Mid Midan Eyrd in Old English, where mortal humans lived. The other realms were Alfheim, Svardalfheim, Vanaheim, Nithheim, Muspetheim, and Jotunheim. Wrong, 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 and wrong. Here's the deal. No medieval source says what the Nine Realms are. We must make choices about what sources we trust. They have made a choice here to trust Snorri Sturluson and the Prose Edda. That is the first appearance of Svardalfheim. We are already well outside of 9th century Norse religious, mythological, or cosmological belief. The Völva, a soothsayer. Uh, so they have a typo. Uh, v, VU is not an allowable combination in Old Norse. It is said V U L U R. One way to divine was to read the runes. Each one held a different power. Nope, that's early modern. That's early modern, it's not at all related to medieval traditions. Another way to gain magical insight was through a ritual trance, the Seder. Nope, it's not a ritual. The first person to practice the Seder was the goddess Freya. Yes, but it's not a ritual, it's just magic. The only sentence of this that I would keep is that, uh, these two sentences at the start of the second paragraph. From Avalva to Harmva. That's it, that is the only part of this that I would keep. So the Virva, or the Spaukana, is a CRS by trade. Through a variety of means, uh, primarily through communication with spirits, uh, or Nauter, uh, literally essences. Uh, they are able to interact with uh, and gain insight from these spirits into other worlds. Freya must know that cats are better creatures than people. This is a true statement, and a big shout outs for Thorstein for knowing the facts that cats are good people. Cats. The goddess Freya. Freya was among the most gifted of the Norse gods at Seder, the art of divination of prophecy. You know, they got, they got Seder right there. Uh, Galdr is a more neutral term for magic, especially sung incantations, though you might also use Urun for that. Seder, however, is uh, something that appears to attack someone's luck, uh, or to put some great risk to someone's luck, and so is largely viewed with distrust and as a fairly malicious type of magic. Uh, it, Freya is a uh, digraph of Freyr, uh, or it's the uh, feminization of Freyr. So Freyr means lord, Freya therefore means lady, while Frigg means wife or woman or beloved one. So yeah, her name is uh, not very helpful. It just it just means a uh, lady. Odin knows I cannot resist the By the way, need. she is carving Listen, turnips. Everyone has somewhere they ought to I just want to point Easy. it out. 
An individual inherit inherited certain values, rules and values from their kin, according to a legend, ancestors would visit the young in dreams, sometimes, yes, to pass on the family's wisdom. Values could also be shared by the family's hamingya or guardian spirit. Not, not so much attested. The first one is really well attested in the Norasaga corpus, the second one, not so much. What is true, though, is that family characteristics uh, will pass on through generations. Uh, while warriors who died in, in battle could look forward to feasting in the halls of Valhoch, or Folkvanger, those who died of sickness or old age, according to the Prozida, went to Hell, or Helheim. Not or Helheim, just Hell. Uh, the cold and misty realm of Niflheim, pictured here, was another final destination. This is wrong because Hell is inside of Niflheim. What they should be saying here is Niflhel, Mist Hell. Murderers, earthbreakers, and traitors were punished for their crimes by being sent to this cruel land. Well, more specifically, within this cruel land, they are sent to Naustrund, the beach uh, of the deceased, where they will be devoured for eternity uh, by none other than Nidhogr, the colossal dragon that lives at the roots of Yggdrasil and will survive Ragnarok to continue to bring death upon the world. Welcome to Folkvanger. Or Folk, yeah, Folkvanger in Modern and in Icelandic. Where Thorstein is finally, at long last, united with Gunnhilda. They get their, happily at their happy afterlife. This Viking's journey has come to an end. Yo, yeah, so final thoughts on the Discovery Tour. Uh, as I said at the beginning, at its best, i.e. in quests 2 and 7, and the Isle of Ely and in Jorvik, it is on par with the best history exhibitions in the world. With the interactive media, when it works really well, uh, the sailing section at the end of Quest 4 is another good example of it, the interactivity and narrative, when done thoughtfully, when, when done to properly uh, emulate Norse literary tropes, you see it is something truly phenomenal. At its worst, it codifies, elides, and reinforces misconceptions that have been around for a very long time. This is particularly true anytime they are talking about uh, Norse religion and Norse mythology. There is a lot of room for improvement to really broaden and change popular conceptions of what Norse religion is, means, and uh, how we think about it, and how we separate the Eddic material from the 13th century uh, and from primarily Iceland from the massive decentralization and diversity of religions present in Scandinavia in the Viking Age. There was so much better that they could have done here, and I'm rather disappointed to see it fall into a thing where I can have two pages of notes that primarily say, you know this drill, just go for it. Because I said all of this before. Still, this was excellent, and I want to th thank once again Ubisoft for giving me a review, a review copy so that I was able to do all that research, get the books I needed to, talk to the people I needed to, and make this shine. Takfir Komana. Sajk. Obleswit.